Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 11 of the Book Talk Today podcast, where today we'll be joined by New York Times bestselling author of the book Essentialism and host of his podcast uh, called Essentialism as well, uh, Greg McCohen and his book Essentialism. Greg, it's a pleasure to have you on. We've been, I've been very much looking forward to this conversation. I'm so glad to be with you, on. <laughs> Definitely. So, we actually had a book club last week where we discussed your book. Um, there was six of us and we were discussing the elements of your book. And the interesting thing that popped into my mind is that people were from all around the world. So we had a couple of people from India, we had Philippines, we had Mexico. And it was very interesting how societal factors determined how each individual society saw essentialism at its core. The question I wanted to ask you is when you were writing the book, did that play into your mind when you're writing it to try and make it accessible for different cultures or did you have one in mind? Um, I definitely wanted to write something that was um, that was cross-cultural uh, that would be um, as universal as possible uh, and one of the ways I think to try and achieve that is to write something that's personal you know you've heard the old phrase that that's that which is most personal is most universal. Mm. Um, and so I've been pleased to see essentialism um, uh, be picked up and have, uh, you know, I don't know what we're in 25 languages or something now and, and to, to, to hear from people around the world uh, that it resonated with them. Uh, but with all that, I'm quite curious what you found in your book club. What, what did you notice was different between the different cultures? How did they res respond to the ideas? Well, it, the interesting thing for me was people who were from, let's say, conservative societies where religion played a large role. Mm -hmm. I was thinking uh, we, had a, we had a girl from, uh, we, she lived in Indonesia um, and she was from a conservative family and I'm Muslim as well. So I can, I can test to this as well as you find the commonalities within the principles within your own, you know, religious framework or spiritual framework. And you think, you think to yourself, yes, this element is in these scriptures. This is how we are supposed to live our life. We're, we're supposed to have detachment to a certain degree to this, to this life in general. Then you had others who didn't have a spiritual or they were in a society where perhaps there wasn't that, that uh, grounding in religious teachings and they had a very different way of seeing detachment and attachment and, and essentialist ideas. So for me, the interesting thing was some people attributed it to material objects and other mm. people attributed to other things such as family and how they spent their time. And it was interesting to see that dichotomy between the East and the West, which was essentially material. The, there is a huge material difference. And I think for people like me, who's sort of third generation immigrant, you're sort of, you're in that, you're in that sort of precipice between the two, because <laughs> you're, you're born and brought up in a society like I am from Britain, but my, my family's not, my grandparents weren't. So there's that strong fam familial connections, but obviously you're getting bombarded with material possessions. So for me, it's quite nice to see that dichotomy, but for others, when I was, cause I was observing during this book club, seeing how people were, we're taking it differently. Has that been your experience as well when talking to people and, and hearing how people have taken the book, seeing those differences between how people see perhaps materialism, but also how they define essentialism as well? Yes, I think that there are uh, levels or layers of essentialism uh, and, and people can read it, it at different levels. So at the most surface level, and I don't mean shallow even, but still level one uh, would be the stuff in your life, right? I mean, I use the actual metaphor of the closet and how it can become overstuffed if you fall into the undisciplined pursuit of more, uh, then eventually uh, it, you consume all the space you have and you start to have, a, um, you know, less joy, enjoyment, fulfillment um, mm -hmm. as it gets to too cramped, you can't find anything, it becomes a mess and all of that. So that's sort of level one essentialism would be literally clearing out all that clutter, selecting carefully those things that you actually want and are useful to you and that aid you uh, in, in your life and uh, beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, even that alone, again, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's shallow. I think that if somebody starts to apply essentialism in that way, they will get uh, quite an immediate payoff. They will feel the satisfaction of 
being more deliberate and having just those things that help them, they'll feel less bullied by their stuff. Um, and so even though I didn't write effort, uh, essentialism, excuse me, um, with anything of minimalism in mind, I, I didn't, I didn't commit it from that angle. Uh, okay. I think that those that embrace minimalism at, the, at this sort of physical stuff level will, will find it complementary. But level two is, uh, you know, the, it's the schedule, it's your time. Uh, what is on your calendar and how careful are you and thoughtful about what, you know, what you put there? Are you allowing uh, Zoom meetings to consume your ever waking moment in this COVID time, right? Where, 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 or, or at least just screen time that consumes you and it, it, you get to five o'clock and you don't think even many people aren't even thinking, okay, well, I probably should end, have a boundary for my day that goes to six and seven and eight and nine and 10, 11. I mean, what, there's no, there's no end to the internet. It's an infinite, uh, you know, an infinite pool. We're never going to get to the end of yeah. the internet. So, but you sometimes get into those patterns. And, and so essentialism at that level is saying, well, what re who matters to you and what things should you be, you know, where should you be spending your, your precious resource of time? Mm. But I think for those that have ears to hear, there is at least one more level. Uh, and, and that I think is where you start to see it with its deeper spiritual undertones where, where it's going, I mean, really it's, it's who do I serve in my life? Mm. Uh, you know, what, what are the, those very few things that I would commit my whole life to. And, and I think that that, that that's the question. The answer has to do with, uh, what people's uh, training and experience is and faith background is. And, uh, but at the very final chapter of the book, I do write a, a bit about what I think are, the, are the, the, the deeper principles behind a disciplined way of living. Mm. Uh, so so in, in, in a sense, I mean, the word discipline and disciple comes from the same root word. I mean, it's a discipled way of living. And well, who, who are you serving? What are you a disciple to? Everyone's a disciple to something. But how thoughtful is someone being in, 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 in wh who they serve and, and why they're doing what they're doing? Mm. Uh, so I think that essentialism can operate at different levels depending on how, you know, depending on who's reading it. Uh, and in some ways, how prepared they are for those different levels. True. And how willing they are to even conjure up the thought of going down those different levels, isn't it? It's, you've, you've taken the one step, but how much, you, how thoughtful are you going to be as you go down each individual step? It was interesting you said that you didn't, you didn't do it consciously with Japanese minimalism in mind. Did it not even cross your mind when you were writing the book? Did it, did it factor in? Because it seems like a lot of people that I've spoken to about the book attribute the idea very closely to <laughs> that minimalist way of thinking or that lifestyle in general, especially in Japanese culture. So it, would, it seems a bit strange to me that it didn't even cross your mind or you didn't write it with that purpose. Well, yeah. So it's, it's like this. So, so um, my background is in leadership development uh, and strategy. And so I was working with Silicon Valley companies and and a student of leadership and so i came at essentialism from a leadership perspective what kind of leadership is required to break through to the next level of success once you've had success what kind of leadership is brings you to the next level and as i studied that question essentialism really is what came out of it that's one of the reasons that i used the language uh, essentialist uh, was to try and name the kind of leader you would need to be to be able to to not just become successful in the first place but but to not be caught in the trap of success what what is required to to continue discovering a higher point of contribution uh, yes. because I found that that in very many instances success became so consuming for people they really didn 't have even any time to work or invest in the next level. And so success, however, however much people want it and, and like having it, uh, it can become a catalyst for failure. And so, and so really that's, I was trying to name that, you know, tangible phenomenon in leadership 
dynamics in teams, in companies. Mm. Uh, and, and, and so that was the angle. Okay. It, it wasn't that I was unfamiliar with minimalism. It, I mean, indeed, some of the examples I use, are, you know, are from, are from, well, very selective, extremely selective designers like, uh, you know, um, less but better is sort of the, the, the essence of, of the essentialist approach. Uh, but what I was surprised by was when, when essentialism came out, people, you know, oh, the, you know, I would be, it would be on, okay, here are the top 20 minimalist books that you should read and essentialism would be one of them. And because I just hadn't come at it from that angle, I just didn't realize that, it, that people would contrast it to those kinds of books sure. that just, you know, that's how Amazon chose to put it. Oh, this is part of the minimalism world. Oh, okay. Well now I'm a part of that. But really I had come from it from a very leadership perspective and what dynamics uh, are required to be able to, uh, to lead our life or our team in a way that we can actually make those breakthroughs. Definitely. That, that makes total sense if you're going to do it from that angle, because perhaps the book being like the ism, as soon as you add the ism onto it, doesn't it? It becomes something else. If you called it the essentialist, it might have been taken in a different way. As soon as you add the ism on the end, it sort of takes a different, different way to it. Interestingly enough, when you were talking about the success factors or how people define success and they sort of close themselves within themselves because they might stop themselves getting to the next level, was where did you see that in practice? Was it material success was it when it comes to status was it come to keeping in the same level that they were in in those individuals in silicon valley when they were sort of closing themselves off was it for material reasons was it because they're trying to keep up their status when they were trying to stay in the same level um at first i observed the phenomenon more at an organizational level um so so the pattern was that in the early days, an organization would be very focused on it will be small uh, and very focused on a few objectives. Uh, and, and of course, not all organizations do this. They don't all follow the pattern I'm about to describe. A lot fail immediately. <laughs> yeah. uh, they, they never get focused and they try you know, got three people in the company, but they're trying to do 50 different things. And, and if you do that and don't learn fast enough, which few things to go after you, you aren't going to survive for very long. So, you know, there's that whole story, but I was intrigued by those that did find focus, whether by chance or, uh, or, or deliberateness, they find an idea that they go, okay, this is what we're doing. We're not doing those 10 things. We're doing this one thing. And when they had that clarity, it, it highly correlated with success when they got focused. And it's quite a logical idea. If you just, focus on the right idea at the right time and you've got a small team focused on it you all know what each other are doing and you know what the goal is and you you stop playing politics you you just can all work together unified to achieve you know a set objective uh, so clarity led to success success just breeded more options and opportunities now so far i'm describing a pattern that i mean sounds like the problem that you want to have um, yeah, definitely, but it does in fact turn out to be a problem if it leads to the fourth phase, um, which, uh, you know, Jim Collins called the undisciplined pursuit of more. And so if suddenly because you're successful and because you have these options coming to you, you aren't thoughtful and careful, mm. or should I say it this way? Um, if you aren't more thoughtful and more careful than you were, a few months or years before, mm -hmm. then you will plateau mm -hmm. or fail altogether. And so th this, this has been true for an enormous number of companies that were once successful, started to plateau or failed altogether. And so I just was so fascinated by that because, because it's, it's overly simplistic to just accuse, well, they just, well, they just made bad decisions. Well, they, well, therefore, they must be just bad managers, bad executives, bad. That's what happened here. Um, I mean, it, it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't f feel right. You know, these are the people that led, drove success in these companies. They, they, they were able to build tremendous momentum. Um, I mean, think of BlackBerry, for example. I mean, they're just yeah. bad managers, just stupid people. Just none of that, none of that 
even feels right. Uh, but as you study it, that's not what happened. Uh, the success itself becomes a driver for this dis disparate decision-making where you start to do too many things and you're perfectly reasonable decisions that you're making actually, because you're saying yes to things that you wanted even two or three years before. I mean, these were your goals. So to not say yes to them is actually counterintuitive. You, of course, this is what you've been waiting for. Now it's arrived. Now you have to say yes. Mm -hmm. And that's what people do. But in fact, that natural instinct, that what feels very sensible decision-making actually leads them to, to, to make decisions that diffuse their effort and start to make it very hard for them to be able to uh, maintain or break through to the next level. And so this is exactly what happened with, uh, with Blackberry, as I've mentioned, that one example, there's so many others, mm. uh, but they just were unable because they're doing so many different things, unable to coalesce their attention to what became the iPhone threat. Uh, and so they just, you know, just carried on doing everything they were doing. Uh, they were in a success trap and success traps are harder to get out of than failure traps. Definitely. So, so do you think that as they make that progression through uh, when acquiring more resources, it takes even more time and deliberation in order to determine what is the most essential things to focus on? So as the growth happens, they have to spend more time thinking about what is truly the right thing to go for. Yes. And, and when I, well, to say they need to spend more time, it may be true that they do, but what I really have experienced is that the amount of time they used to spend disappears. Yes. So, so it's just that the forces of success and optionality are such that you, you just get less and less time to think. And so is it, now this, we're all taught, you know, the whole conversation so far, right? It's all about the organizational level, but the same pattern mm. turns out to be true at the individual level. And so, you know, it, it's, that the same problem takes place where we start to, you know, one time in our lives with, you know, fewer options. And so we can be more focused and we, we can be thoughtful about what our goals are. And as we start to achieve those goals, as we start to become successful, the demands on our time are so much greater. Mm. Uh, and so the, the, it squeezes out time to think. Now, even if, you know, somebody listening or watching this, doesn't feel super successful. They almost certainly are experiencing this pattern, this paradox of success, because uh, because the world is successful, and, and and with all the challenges of 2020, it, it, maybe people don't feel that exactly, but uh, but it's still the most extraordinary time to be alive. I mean, it, you're still far no matter where you're born in the world, you're far more likely to be born in democracy than ever in history. You're far more likely uh, to be literate than ever in history. You're far less likely to die from, from disease or from war than any time in, re you know, so basically in history. Um, so as a result, almost everybody has way more options than they could possibly fulfill right now. And those options are all sorts, right? It's entertainment options, it's learning options, it's, it's, I mean, there's just so many things we can do, just internet continues to be the news. And so you just have so much stuff that you could be doing that uses up every moment. And so it used to be that if you were, if, if, if you were late for a plane or if you were, uh, if, if somebody didn't show up for a meeting that you just had to be bored for a bit, you're like, okay, well, I gotta wait. And, and then you had to think, you might not want to, but you had to. But now we all know that's not what we do. No matter what we've done the moment before, what we do next is check our phones. Yeah. So we're using up every moment of what used to be thinking time for just doing. We're just doing, entertaining, reacting, emailing, texting back and forth. And so, so as a result, this is what keeps us back from being able to break through to the next level of contribution and success in our life. We've got to create space again. Mm. We got to create space to think, create space to plan, so that we don't just waste our lives plateaued uh, with all the options we currently have. Yeah, you alluded to that in the book. It was that make time for just thinking, um, and there was that one quote that I really liked in the book. It was um, um, I'm trying to remember what it was exactly, but it was something along the lines: "The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing." 
So is, is, is it related to that quote, the idea that your main thing as you go is to keep what you started with the main thing and not get distracted by the other things? Um, yeah. I mean, look, look if you, you know, well, let me share with a story. So one of the personal experiences while I was working at this organizationally and looking at the team level happened personally when I got an email from my manager at the time said, look, Friday between uh, one and two would be a very bad time for your wife to have a baby. Um, and, uh, you know, my wife was expecting, otherwise that's an even weirder email uh, to receive. Yes, it would uh, be. Uh, but, but, you know, the, we, we, my wife and I were going to the hospital Thursday night. My wife goes into labor. Our daughter's born in the early hours of Friday morning. And instead of being totally present for that, focused on that, this is what matters, clearly. Uh, I feel torn and pulled and I'm, 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 I'm on my email and I'm, I'm just trying, how do I keep everybody happy? And, and so to my, well, to my shame, I went to, um, you know, I went to that meeting and afterwards, I remember, uh, my manager said, look, the client will respect you for the choice you just made. And, and maybe they did. Uh, although I don't remember the look on their faces evincing that sort of respect. Mm. Uh, but what I learned from that lesson or experience rather was, uh, if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. And, and so I think that that's at the heart of essentialism is, is don't just let prioritization happen by the forces around you. You know, it's taking responsibility for prioritization. Uh, it, it, it's, it's because for so many people, maybe especially in these times, um, it, people feel busy, but not necessarily productive. Uh, people feel stretched too thin at work or at home. And those are sort of integrated now as a, mm. as a positive word for what it's like for a lot of people. It's all, you know, it's all just become one uh, perpetual experience. Uh, for a lot of people, their day is, is hijacked by other people's agenda for them. And so essentialism is trying to encourage people to see that experience and to recognize it doesn't have to be that way you you can it may be a path less traveled but it doesn't make it um less valuable right this this, this discipline pursuit of less is 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 an alternative strategy to, for, for life and as it turns out uh, a much more fulfilling one uh and and one that um you know, what do you, you take back control of your, of your life, of your choices, of your day, of what you're doing. Uh, and, and the sooner someone can do that, the better, hmm. uh, the, the, perhaps the most kind of unfortunate, um, correspondence I get from people are people that say, you know, yes, I, I read essentialism. This made a difference. It may be even life changing, but this is literally true. Somebody said to me, they, uh, emailed me and they said, um, they said, I just wish I'd read it 50 years ago. I mean, 50 years 50. ago. It's not like, yes, exactly. Yeah, right. They say, it's not, just, it's that's... not like a year ago or five yeah. years ago. I mean, 50 years. What is it? What, what, what is somebody lost over a 50 year period yeah. of living by default by other people's agenda rather than by design, mm. by what really feels like the most important, the most essential things, uh, being, being, uh, being front and center yeah that's crazy to think about because 50 years like you said it's not just it's not something that you can just reclaim maybe perhaps a year but even a year is a long period of time and one thing that i wanted to ask you specifically about the book was i was reading it and you, there's a there's a section where you talk about play and the importance of play now the thing that crossed my mind was as a as a kid as a child you have a very you have a very it's a very simplistic way to see play i mean as a kid you know what play is you go out, play with your friends, toys, whatever it might be. However, as an adult, I feel there's a very big gray area around the word play or how to define it or the activities associated with it. How would you define play in the realm of essentialism in adults specifically? How would you define play? What activities would you associate towards that definition? Or do you think it's just dependent on the individual and how they see it? I, I think that, um, I mean, there's a whole chapter on play. And so I think, I think that, that can get into it in, in, 
a decent amount of depth. Um, a lot of the time people think as they become adults that just that any play is trivial. That if, if, it, if you even call it play, it, it, anything close to play mm. is, uh, is non-essential. Mm. You, 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 and, and, and for lots of people, I mean, if somebody is a workaholic, if they're not working, they think they're wasting time. Yeah. So it almost doesn't matter what else it is. If it's not you know, building their business, if it's not answering you know, work-related tasks, if it's not trying to get ahead in the professional realm, then, then it's just completely pointless. And, and I completely, um, you know, my, my research suggests that's not true at all. I mean, play can take different levels. Um, but I mean, sometimes it's overthinking it to even talk about the different levels. I mean, just <laughs> go, go. If you have kids, go play with your kids. Go, go, play, go play a board game. Go, go read a book. Uh, read fiction that's uh, that's that's helpful and inspiring to you. Turn off your phone. Do do something not on a screen. Of course, there's lots of play on a screen, and I, and I'm not saying you can't do anything on a screen, but it's a very different feeling. So so it's I mean, play to me is uh, it would include um, you know my wife and I go on a walk. Maybe I won't say absolutely every day, but certainly every other day on average, uh, and it, we'll go for an hour and just. To me, that's play. It's, we're just talking. There's no, we don't have an agenda. It's not like a meeting. Here's our five points we're going to go agenda. through. We're just talking. Yeah, exactly. We're just, we're just, we're just, we're just out there talking, playing. When I, when I, we, we're, we're lucky enough to have a, a, a pool that we can swim in through COVID times, and 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 so playing with my kids in the pool is definitely play, and it and 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 it doesn't have to have a st- big structure to it. But if you could strap, you know. A person's brain to you know to, to to a machine to notice you know what the brain waves are doing when you're playing it's lighting up when you're doing something else even if you call it play that's numbing you that's draining you whatever you call it then that's not play mm-hmm. the play is something that doesn't have to be super structured but it's uh, uh, but it's something that that makes you feel i mean all of that all of that, um, the energy that comes from not being structured. Uh, one of one of the most successful play experiments I, I had was when was on a, a family holiday uh, where we were going somewhere that there wasn't going to be Wi-Fi coverage, um, and we could have got Wi-Fi. You just had to go through extra steps to get it. We had no interest in trying to make that happen. We wanted not to have. Uh, access and so for two and a half weeks you know that was one of the longest periods I can recall in my adult life of not being not one time online or one time on a phone you know just just off the grid and that was the most amazing experience as it turns out and this is why it finds its way into the book essentialism because it turns out is as you create time to play you actually have huge breakthroughs in thinking. Mm. The big breakthroughs in thinking rarely happen when you're sitting there intensely trying to solve a problem. It often happens when you're letting your brain relax. And in the relaxed phase, uh, you, you suddenly have discoveries. And, and certainly the most important breakthrough in my career uh, mm. over the last, you know, whatever, five years happened um, you know, on that, you know, in that break for those two and a half weeks. And it didn't come because I had the intention. It's just disconnecting, being allowed to play, recognizing that that in itself is essential, is valuable, I think can be a a, a key to making a higher contribution and how different that is from what we've been taught uh, about always on, you know, hustling 24 seven, uh, which I, I, I think is a, I mean, effectively, I think it's a con. You've probably seen it in practice as well from your own research. Individuals have done that in practice 24 seven and it's contributed because they've probably been very successful up to that point. Then they get to that point in which that time could be better spent, whatever it might be. And then they just hit that plateau and then suddenly they just see some sort of deep dive into the opposite way. Yeah, I mean the 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 twenty four hustle culture has been has been sold to us pretty pretty intensely for quite a long time. Now there's there's counter programming now, but 
I mean, even back into, you know, starting back into the eighties, the idea of, I mean, and I'm not making a political point here, but the idea that, you know, Margaret Thatcher, the iron lady, you know, four hours a night, three hours, two hours a night, that's all she mm-hmm. needs. And, yeah. and that's for 10 years. And as if, as if, if you, as if, as if humans are machines mm. and our job is to try and keep them, the lights on 24 seven. And if you can, productivity goes up. I mean, that is true in a factory system. It's true in industrial engineering. If you can have a system that works automated or you can put it on, on, you know, just different, uh, shifts and the staff come in for eight hours at a time and so on and you can then your productivity as as for that factory does go up your throughput can be increased dramatically and that's what the industrial revolution brought us was this 50x increase in productivity from the agrarian age i mean all of that is true what's not true is trying to apply that to the way a human works Mm -hmm. and that's exactly what has happened in many instances that we think well we need to treat our own bodies our own minds like they're machines uh and and of course that's not what we are so if you want to optimize human performance you don't do what you would do for a factory and and this mismatch between factory type thinking industrial age thinking and and human performance that, that what, what really works compared to what management has basically been taught to think works is why I think we haven't yet taken advantage of the possible tremendous equivalent breakthrough in the knowledge age that we have seen in the industrial age. So Peter Drucker laid down the gauntlet many years ago. He said, in the industrial age, we saw management successfully increased productivity by 50 times, right? That's where I'm, I'm using that reference point. Mm-hmm. He said, in the knowledge age, it will happen again. We will increase it by 50 times again. Well, we haven't yet at all. Um, there's been improvements, but nothing like that level of breakthrough. And I literally think this is why. Uh, it's that we, we still have maintained industrial age thinking. What we need if you, if productivity is produced by people who are thinking, you know, by knowledge workers, you have got to create space for people to be able to think hmm. and not to react and do. You have got to help them have sufficient sleep and rejuvenation so that the quality of their thinking is maximized. And so this is what essentialism is. Is I don't use the Drucker quote in the book, but really this is what I see as its po- potential uh, for, 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 for the world, for the, uh, uh, large, is when you can get the masses to be able to really protect the asset of their mind, body, heart, and spirit. When you really get past lip service to that, when you celebrate sleep, when you celebrate naps, for example, mm. as, a, as a mechanism for higher performance, when you celebrate play as a necessary prerequisite for actually having breakthrough thinking, when you start to think about it that way, you start to go, right that's how we'll get people to break through to these you know these tremendous next level uh, contributions not by having them work like they're a, a machine in a factory so they're exhausted stressed tired then fatigued then burned out mm. i mean how much somebody just sent me a, a photograph of themselves I, i'd never seen anything like this actually it just happened within the last couple of weeks um, Joe, uh, who I just interviewed, she'll be on the podcast at some point, but she sent me a photograph of her before she read Essentialism and afterwards. Uh, this is this is like a multi-year before and after photograph. Oh, okay. And, like a portrait photograph. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And uh, and the first is is how I mean I I, I I hard to describe it, but the first is the is the image of someone who is you can see instantly totally burned out not just tired utterly burned out body burned out uh you know i mean ill looking yeah. ill uh deathly ill and then you know as she not just reads the book of course that's not sufficient but as she starts to be more deliberate and thoughtful suddenly her health is just so much greater and her contribution has gone up considerably this is what essentialists can can do for an individual yeah. but also you know, even at the societal level, we, we have tremendous 
opportunity mm. uh, once we get people to embrace a different way, a different way of working. Where do you think that tipping point comes from the societal point? Well, I mean, it's an interesting question. And, and I, I, I have generally thought it would come from pain. Um, and, and I still think that's a pretty good, um, you know, hypothesis, uh, when humans are in pain, right. We, especially if it becomes acute, we, we're going to look for an, you know, we're highly motivated to avoid pain. Mm. And, and so the idea of like the way we're working is not working, you know, those kinds of phrases and ideas that name something, I think will draw, bring about what I'm just, you know, describing. Uh, people, people can't do burnout. I mean, by definition, you can't do burnout forever. And as you, as you laud and celebrate the types of behaviors that lead to burnout, more and more people will be burned out. Uh, and, and you, you see some of this already happening. I mean, I see, you know, the whole mindfulness movement is an evidence of the problem, becoming so painful that people start going, Oh my heavens, this mental health is suddenly a massive problem. Mm. Uh, these are all evidences of we're in a knowledge age, but we're still using industrial age ideas of how humans perform. Mm. I mean, that is, uh, that isn't sustainable. It can't be sustained. But what it looks like is people being on Zillow at, at two in the morning, scrolling through it, trying to recuperate. This is a true example of someone that shared this with me. They're trying to recuperate by you know, going through this website ad for an item, just trying to create some space to think and to, to not be so pressured. But of course that isn't doing anything. They're not sleeping properly. Uh, it, it makes it worse. Uh, and, and, and I think a lot of people are trying to cope using mechanisms that will actually make the situation worse. And so I think it, as, as this happens, it, it I don't know when it will be the tipping point exactly, but I think one by one, the, the group grows and you say, this, is, this isn't going to work. I've mm. got to find a different way. Uh, I, there's got to be an alternative and suddenly alternatives come forward. Mindfulness thinking, essentialism, playing its, its part, a thrive from Arianna Huffington. These are all you know, voices trying to suggest a, an alternative path to the one that we've been sold for, you know, perhaps the last 50 years. Definitely seen a return or not perhaps a return is not the right word, but a definite shift in, in thinking and especially UK in general, but probably Western society towards a more spiritual way of thinking where it's not just about work. And I've actually seen that not really, really the last 10 years. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm only 27. So, I mean, you've probably seen this more yourself. It's the idea that, you don't need to be working 24 seven and there is a definite shift. I don't know whether this is because of mindfulness. I don't know whether this is because of new methods in which people have taken upon mindfulness like yoga or different types of physical activities, but there's definitely been a resurgence of people asking themselves, why am I doing this? Like for what's the purpose? What's the purpose in which I am doing it? Have you seen that as well? Uh, yes, I have. And, and I think that, I think this will, I think this will just continue. I mean, it's one of the, you know, play, trying to play my little part. Um, well, trying to, trying to do that from my, my corner of the, the, the world. I've been, I'm struck that essentialism even, I mean, normally, normally with books, for example, they, they normally come out and then they, they die and, the only question is how quickly they die. But essentialism hasn't gone that way. It's, it's, it's continued and it's, it's become more successful over time. And I think that's not, that's not a statement of, oh, the book happened to be written well. I think it just happens to be on a subject that is particularly timely. And so, so people, people keep discovering it. And I think that's because of what's happening at society, these forces at play in society. So, uh, I, I think there is there is a growing acknowledgement that we've got to find a new way of working. The the early adopters are convinced, are more willing to be convinced by the idea that 
well, it's not sustainable and I, I can't really cope with that way of working. So I want to find a new way of working. Um, and that, and that's good, right? Those are the, your original people discovering yoga those original people, you know, into mindfulness meditation, but in order to get the, to the tipping point, you have to make a different set of arguments. You have to find, you know, those that, those that really believe that, being a workaholic is the answer and putting more hours in is inevitably going to be successful. People who are just super driven for success, mm. they're like, Oh, I'm not, not, not any interest in this um, uh, it, meditation and mindfulness. I mean, how do you communicate with that group? And I actually think essentialism plays its part there uh, where people who, who otherwise wouldn't be interested, they're just driven to success, find this language that makes sense to them. Uh, and so, uh, and so I think that, uh, I think that it will take a variety of voices to attract different parts of the, you know, different parts of the population mm. until you get to a tipping point. Um, but I, I think there are some pretty interesting signals, right? Where you see, uh, where you see the, you know, the Royal family, the, both sons embracing a, a, basically a mindfulness, mental health foundations mm. and trying to, I mean, the very fact that that's even, that that's even a priority for them and that they want to talk about, that was a very deliberate strategic decision to say, we're going to focus on these subjects. Those kinds of things. Uh, I, I've been to uh, Davos a few times at the World Economic Forum. And I mean, the first time I went, there was, if there was any mention of these themes, it was one small discussion somewhere, one, one thing on the calendar. By the second or third time I was there, it's like, I don't know, it felt like, I can't remember really, but something like 20% of the programming was on, mm. were on these themes. I mean, that's a huge shift mm. in the agenda. Uh, and, and I just think it's, it's going to increase and I see it very positive, the possibilities out of it on the other end. Um, because actually this is how you tap into far more creativity, resourcefulness initiative, uh, mm. within, within, uh, you know, the, the, hu within human capabilities. Yeah, definitely. I think tapping into that purpose element, I think is really important on the individual level. I think the more individuals can have that question going through their minds at all times, because I do believe it's a daily thing. I think you need to continuously be asking yourself in each activity that you take on. And you did allude to it in the book. You were saying at this moment, is this thing the most highly valuable thing that I could be doing right now with my time? And that requires a lot of thought. Like if you're going through your day to day and your boss is like just sending you emails or reports and stuff, it's very difficult to ask yourself at that moment because you're thinking to yourself, oh, I need to get this done by 4 p.m. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. you're, not thinking, you're not thinking to yourself, hmm, perhaps I could, uh, you know, is this the most valuable thing I could be doing right now? It's very difficult, isn't it? Well, one thing I, one thing I've, I mean, I've, I was quite inspired this Joe that I mentioned that, that reached out. So, so I remember I haven't really given her backstory. She, yeah. she, um, she read essentialism and then she started asking her the question, which actually I don't think it's really in the book, but it was her sort of summary. Mm -hmm. It was every day to ask the question, what's the most important thing I can do today? Mm -hmm. And at first her answers were mostly work related, but slowly they changed and they became more about, well, what can I do for self care or protecting the asset, my, you know, myself and health or family. Um, and then, and then one day, you know, into this ongoing essentialist experiment. Uh, her mother is in, goes into hospital and her dad calls and says, oh yeah, she's in hospital again. It, it, she'd, she'd been there a couple of times and, and she's oh, okay. Should I, you know, I can happily come. I, I'd, be, I'd like to come and support. He said, oh, don't be silly. You've got way too much on your plate. Mm. But because she had this practice in mind of every day asking her what's, it, what's most important to do today, she told me that she remembers exactly where she was, what the weather was, everything. It was a very vivid moment that she just knew that the most important thing that she could do that day was to, was to travel to the hospital. So that's two hours away and, and to just be there for her mother. And she was, she went there, she did it. And she, she, she has this moment. She's able to say, um, uh, she, she's able to say to, to her mother that she loves her. 
Hey, did I lose you? Oh no, you're there. Um, she, she's able to say to her mother that, you know, I love you. And her mother says to her, you know, the same thing. I love you. And, mm. uh, and they're, they're sort of saying, Oh, I think you're going to be fine. It's all be all right. But actually within an, I think within an hour of that conversation, um, she, she, uh, she suddenly has, um, you know, really bad reaction. Um, and, and it's a case of sepsis and she, uh, she dies within a week of that moment, but she'd gone into a coma within, I think, an hour of that conversation. And so she's sharing this with me. I mean, it's hard not to be touched by that. I mean, she's yeah. like, if I wasn't an essentialist, I wouldn't have been there. I wouldn't have gone that day. I was being encouraged not to go. Mm. But asking that question day after day had increased her discernment mm. uh, to the answer. And so I came away from that inspired myself to really ask that question every, you know, every morning, just ask that question. It's a quite a realistic way to do it. It's not an easy answer. You know, it's not always easy to get the answer, but that way you're not having to stress yourself out all day, but at least once a day you get clear what really is the most important thing to do today. And that just helps to create a sort of guide post for the rest of the day mm. you know there'll be emotional ups and downs there'll be all sorts of requests there's always things that are unexpected but through all of it you say yeah but the most important thing was x i'll just keep on steering around that and as long as i focus on that you know other things will fit into their proper place or even fall out of my life altogether today do you believe that's the best way to find that highest point of contribution i think it's i think it's one of Maybe, I don't know, maybe four or five things that I'd really recommend to people. Mm. Um, yeah. A second thing I would recommend is, uh, is scheduling a personal quarterly offsite. Um, so that something like once a quarter, you're really sitting down, you know, without your phone in your hand, without your phone anywhere close. And you're just writing out a review of the last quarter, what's happened, what worked, what didn't work, setting really clearly what are the, less but better goals the few goals that you think are going to be important and and allowing generous time for that um mm. i mean i i just finished a, a big project i've been working on a new book and just finished that and it was very tempting just to just just jump back into things that i put on hold because of being in monk mode it was tempting to to just Positive, be positively reactive, let's say. Just, okay, what's the next set of stuff? Let's go. And my wife suggested, well, you probably ought to take a couple of weeks just to, just to pause, just to, just to think. And I did that. And it was like, it really was, it was almost like I became an essentialist again. Uh, I felt like a, a bit like a child just rediscovering it and going, my goodness, I, I got my life back. Mm. And, and still now, I'm, I've removed tons of things off my schedule and I just completely committed to keeping on doing it because mm. it's such an advantage. Uh, so personal quarterly offsite, it would be, you know, second thing, a third, I'd recommend people really, um, after any request, they just pause, uh, pause allows you to have a conversation about it. Ask a question, uh, pause allows you to negotiate Mm. um pause it doesn't mean you have to say no just pause this just i i i taught this to um to a group an education uh, university leaders at university and one of those leaders um came away realizing when she, she emailed me afterwards and she said you know i wouldn't even take break for lunch i even thought that was like an acceptable thing to do you know that that was poor for poor productivity. Uh, she said, it's just how workaholics feel. Yeah. Uh, and so when the next request that came in for her, she had somebody say, um, say, Oh, listen, I want you to record, you know, she's response. She has the videography team under her, uh, auspices. And, and they, they said, we want you just to record our whole class this semester. Uh, and she, in the past would have just said, you know, just instantly, yes, let's go. I've got the team. We're great. We're efficient. We'll make this happen. Uh, you know, I'll show you how good I am, how competent I am. And this time she just paused to just ask a question. I mean, there's nothing offensive whatsoever in what she did. She just said, okay, well, you need to just tell me a little bit more about what you're trying to achieve. You know, why are you trying to do that? 
you know, what, what, what's going on. And, and in this very simple discovery process, only a few minutes of discovery found that all that they were trying to do was accommodate one student who was going to be in some sports, you know, had conflicts for this class, but they still needed to take this class. And so they're just trying to help this student make it through. And then they come up together within like a half an hour chat. We'll just have one of the other students use their iPhone and record every session. That's it. That's how you can solve this. And the, the internal client is really happy with that solution. They hadn't quite thought through it themselves. And so now they were like, yeah, okay, that totally solves it. Easy solution. Don't have to coordinate anything. And this leader that was making these changes, she's like, I got all of that time back. I would have had my whole team there every class for a whole you know, three months and all of that resource suddenly was returned for the sake of a pause and a little conversation. So mm. discovering that you can, you have a lot of choices if you'll pause and, uh, and ask a question or push back a little bit, uh, it allows you uh, to, to better discern whether you really should be doing something or if there's an easier solution. Definitely. So those are three things that I would recommend. Do you believe in value driven goals rather than perhaps um uh sorry identity driven goals rather than something that is uh, more materialistic do you do you think that got people's goal setting because i believe this essentialism mindset this 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 framework is very much driven on identity it's very much driven by how you see yourself is that how you see your goal setting your personal goal setting is it very much identity driven in your case or do you believe it to be so um, yes, I certainly would think that. I mean, for, for me personally, you know, I, the way that I see, you know, the, the way I see life uh, has purpose, uh, was designed with meaning. Um, I, I believe in the, the universal, you know, brotherhood of man that we are, that we are, you know, um, that we are part of one great family, uh, children of God. And so I believe that we didn't come here by chance and that our work therefore is not, is not so much one of just creation, but one of discernment mm -hmm. that we have to discern and discover what we came here to do. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm highly conscious of that in my own goal setting. I I'm, I'm uh, deeply driven and motivated by the desire to discover those things and then to pursue them and really nothing else um, because once you what once you discover your at any given period of your life your highest contribution when, once you del whether that's professionally or personally um, then then you have a big burning yes inside of you that gives you courage to say no to other things, including mostly, in fact, yourself, uh, saying no to all sorts of distractions that could come your way or other shiny objects that could come along and, uh, or competition. You, other people are doing it a certain way and you think, oh, for a moment, you think, well, that's, they, they're doing that so successfully. Maybe I should be doing that. And then you try to straddle multiple strategies just because of uh, the fear of missing out. I, I, I want so much to push those things away so that I can discern that quieter um, voice of conscience that can guide me in what goals to set and in what to pursue and in what not to pursue. To me, this is the path towards much greater satisfaction, uh, much more progress and well, a feeling, you know, the, the, that, that you are doing what you came here to do. What, what's more satisfying than this? I know of nothing more satisfying. Uh, and I know of many, many things less satisfying. Uh, and the non-essentialist path is full of those non-satisfying, busy, relentless, uh, you know, um, motion sick type experience in life uh, that doesn't deliver on its promises. So I, I, I rejoice in the idea that there's this alternative, uh, alternative uh, path um, that I'm calling the essentialist path, but of course has many different names. Definitely. I think that's a great way to end it. Thank you so um, much for having me. Thank you. It was great having you on. Uh, wh where can people find you? What have you got going on at the moment? Big projects. 
Um, so uh, I, I'm thrilled about the new Essentialism podcast. So this is, uh, this is where a lot of these fun conversations are taking place. I'm learning a great deal. People can find that wherever they find podcasts. Um, or they can go to essentialism.com and, uh, and they'll be, you know, they'll find you know, all the, the right things that, uh, to pursue. I've also uh, been launching a one minute Wednesday, which is one minute every week. It's like just a way to touch base uh, uh, on something that's essential and something that matters. People can sign up for that also at essentialism.com. Uh, and uh, you know, those are the things right now. Definitely sounds great. And I look forward to the new book. I know you mentioned you. earlier. I know you probably <laughs> can't say what it's about, but <laughs> when, I, is, I, when, I, is, when is that? When is that coming to bookshelves near 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 everyone? Well, it will be it will be launched officially in in April of uh, 2021, but it will be available uh, before that uh, for you know for, for pre purchase. We'll do some fun things around that uh, here soon, where people that uh, that purchase it early can can come and join a, a live class and that kind of thing. Uh, that we'll be doing so so there'll be fun things that those that uh, uh, that are early early adopters of the new <laughs> of the new book can be a part of that sounds great that sounds great i look forward to reading it thank you thanks for your time